Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for visiting. This is the podcast, Shut Up and Laugh. My name is Brian Trendler. I've been running this little show for the past uh, about a year and a half now, and very, very excited today uh, to welcome a very special guest that I've known for many, many years. But first, as always, I want to greet and thank my sponsors of this particular podcast series, which is now the Zoom cast series as well. Um, at the same time, if you have a business and you would like some exposure with my growing listenership and now watchership, um, you can do that by going to anchor.fm forward slash shut up and laugh. You can click the sponsor link and find out what those opportunities are. Or you can go to the website, which is laughtechnw.com forward slash shut up and laugh. And the first part of that alias is L-A-F-T-E-C-H-N-W. So my sponsors, Dreamosity, a very special business partner of mine, Marcel Allen. She runs a social media training company. She can help you do everything better with your social media, with your exposure and your syndication. So thank you, Dreamosity. LT's Pet Sitting, uh, that is, is actually my sister. She is a in-home pet sitter and she does a great job when giving you peace of mind. If you can't get back to the house in time, if you're out and about, if you're traveling, if anyone's allowed to travel nowadays, she can take care of your animals and keep them home where they're safe and secure. And then Gentle Frog Custom QuickBooks Training. Rachel Barnett is an amazing trainer of the QuickBooks and she'll teach you everything you think you're doing right about how to run your business. And she'll train you on how to do it better, answer all of your questions. And she's one of the Pacific Northwest's highest, highest, whoa, making up words here, highest rated QuickBooks trainer. So give her a shout. With that being said, I wanna give a shout out to a friend of mine who I've known, geez, man, it's been many, many years. Sean Smith, everybody. Hi, <laughs> good to Hello. see you. Yeah, you know. um, yeah. Oh my gosh, Sean, I don't even know where to start. Um, you are in recovery right now, and I'm gonna go a little deeper into that in just a second, but... Um, for everyone who's listening and now watching, I do a quick little deep dive into his sort of little background. Um, I have known you since middle school. Correct. And that was actually a short period and the, that'll all make sense later. And then I knew you during high school as well. Um, you live in the Olympia, Washington area. Um, you are, I don't know if you're owner or work with Got Lung Industries. That's what it shows in one of your profiles. Um, so is, is that where you're working or are you currently oh, working? It's, it's, uh, I'm not currently working. I'm, I'm still on uh, disability, uh, okay. um, SDI yep. or social security. And, um, that may change in the future. The gut lung industries is something I created, uh, that I hope to have become a company. Okay. Very good. So future expansion, that'll be another talk we'll have at some point. Yes. And um, key thing, because she's also there in the room, uh, you're married to the amazing Bohemia Isis Smith. So that yes. is your lovely bride. Yes, yes. Uh, I have a feeling she's going to put herself on the proverbial mute and not participate today, but that's okay. She's in the background, everybody lurking. Yeah. What's that? She, she's, she's, uh, she's being very quiet. <laughs> okay. It, right. it, I yeah. tend to interrupt too much, so I'm staying out of it. <laughs> yeah. There we go. There we go. Okay. Well, interrupt anytime. Yeah, she, she's kind of my uh, my second memory on certain things. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I go, is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, so. I have noticed that that form of a significant other does tend to be an accountability tractor. That's, a, that's, yeah. another, that's another label there that you can throw out. Um, so, again, this feels like a high school reunion to me, even though you were a class ahead of me and, and still more classy than me. Um, well, no, yeah, no, I, I, I will fight you on, on that. That's definitely a given. But Sean, there's so many things that I want to talk to you about and just have you share with, again, our listeners and viewers. You chose by way of fate, the stars, the medical miracles and everything else to get a double lung transplant in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> You know, I wasn't doing anything anyway. Yeah, you were just kind of hanging around. So I'm going to, this will benefit Orange. everybody. I'm going to shut up for a minute and I'm going to let you explain how that happened. And don't go too far back because I have other questions for you, but you've sure. literally been waiting for how many years for this? 
And how um, did it recently all come about? Let's just yeah, jump into that. Well, yeah, just brief. But yeah, we have known each other since, uh, oh my gosh, I'm trying to think, like 1983, I think, or 84. It should be about uh, right. Right ahead of you. Yeah. Um, but met in middle school. And uh, my eighth grade year, um, we were in, well, we were in choir together. We, yeah. uh, my Glee seventh, club. <laughs> yeah, seventh and eighth grade year. Yeah. And my, and um, yeah, eighth grade year, I just kind of disappeared um, about mid-February. And uh, just to brief on it, that's when my pulmonary issues kind of started. I had unchecked pneumonia that turned into a condition called acute respiratory distress syndrome okay. and ended up hospitalized for about six months, Children's Hospital. Um, had a recovery from that. And we can go into that more later if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but everything kind of started. And then in 2000, um, I had been basically living a normal life and um, started missing some work and being fatigued and went into the doctor and they go, um, you know, you've got this interstitial lung disease. And within, that was like the beginning of October of 2000. And by the end of the October, I was out of work, put on disability, and told I had five years to get a lung transplant. Oh, guy, because the um, diagnosis usually has a three to five year um, lifespan, generally. Um, I got involved with um, some programs that really changed and turned myself around. I stabilized, put everything in a holding pattern mm -hmm. basically until about six years ago. Um, so they put transplant on hold for me until about six, 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 seven years ago when my pulmonologist um, said, you know, things are starting to look a little worse. And I'm like, how can they get worse? But he's like, they are, and we should revisit the whole transplant uh, idea. And I'm like, okay. And so I went on to the official transplant list at the University of Washington, um, like I said, about six years ago, and um, waited and waited and waited <laughs> until this past August, mm -hmm. uh, I got the call for new lungs. And that was uh, August 28th. And on August 29th, they started the surgery to give me new lungs. They finished, wrapped me all up and, and uh, everything on the 30th of August. And uh, I got a transplant. Yeah. And uh, in true Sean fashion, I don't do anything simple or easy, <laughs> but I had a few complications yeah. with my um, and ended up spending um, four days short of 90 days in the hospital before I was discharged on November 23rd. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, I had an infection that, that kept me sedated for about 17 days right after. And mm -hmm. yeah, recovering from that, it's amazing how much um, one body fat you lose, which I do not recommend that particular weight loss <laughs> program. Yeah, yeah. But, so a little drastic. Yeah, it's the muscle mass you lose too. Yeah. So I have, I've been having to regain you know, a lot of function mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it's still a process right now um, that I'm going through. But yeah, but as of right now, the lungs are functioning great. Mm. Uh, I've, I've had several procedures to, which is pretty typical to um, try to open up the airway, yep. you know, and uh, in fact, I have one tomorrow. Uh, had one last Thursday and last Tuesday, mm -hmm. so I'm a frequent flyer into the bronchoscopy. Uh, I was going to say, so that so that's all the bronchial work that you're talking. Yeah, about. They keep going back in to increase the airflow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, basically, my right airway is restricted, so they go in and they do some injections that kind of help open it up. Sure. And yeah. So, so that's that process, and then mm. that's called that's a rigid bronch, and then I get soft bronchs, which are more where they go in and they. Um, suck any fluids out that might be in there. They do a biopsy to make sure everything's, you know, playing well. Sure. And so, um, the rigid bronchs I, I'm not really fond of because they do put me all the way out on those and end up on a ventilator. Yeah. And I'm not crazy about ventilators, um, but so far they've all gone really smooth and, and great. Yeah. Um, a couple of weeks ago, they weren't sure if I was having a rejection issue, but they did some tests and, uh, it was just basically a, uh, um, a uh, an infection. Yeah, sure. So, um, treated me with some antibiotics, and and I'm feeling better. So, so no rejection issues yet. Which no rejection, because generally you 
do have the rejection, pro, pro, you know, issue at some point in time. But yeah. uh, so far, you know, everything's going good. Um, it's it's yeah. just unbelievable. I mean, I I have again for our listeners and viewers that they don't know any of this. I I reconnected with you probably about six some odd years ago with through you know with the with the with, with the joy of social media yeah, <laughs> use yeah. that term loosely i started okay. realizing that oh i can connect with all these people i went to high school with and yeah. whether it was six years or ten years it, it doesn't matter but i have yeah. only known you excuse me in of course uh, in in regard to the social media connections as the guy walking around with tubes up your nose right, yeah. the entire time, the huge air tanks you've had to lug around for countless years. And honestly, it's broken my heart because I, I keep thinking to myself, my God, the vehicle space you must need, you know, because like how, how long did one of those tanks last, one of those portable tanks? Yeah, when I ended up on the, the, the E-tanks, the tall uh, yeah. cylinder one, they would last me maybe two hours, hour and a half, two hours. Oh, you know, that little. Okay, so yeah, two and a half hours. But yeah, to go anywhere, it was always okay. Do I have a full one? How many do I trunk or you know the back seat or wherever? You know, it, they're just planning to go anywhere was crazy with tanks. Yeah, but you were also doing marathons. Well, Wh whether yeah. whether you did the whole thing or not, <laughs> five days and uh, I, I did do the um, Capital City Marathon down in Olympia the five mile walking portion and you and, were pushing the damn thing in front of you yeah yeah when i first started i had smaller tanks yeah. that i put backpack i'd get a hydration backpack from costco costco plug maybe there'll be a sponsor um anyway uh, um but i'd put them in there and i could run the cannula through the hydration loop things and you know it was pretty nice but then as my condition progressed i had to go to the larger tanks and so i had to kind of re reinvent how to do that mm -hmm. and so i took a baby stroller a jogging stroller and um had a a guy who does uh sewing and stuff he made me a backpack actually that holds an e-tank but he also made conversion things for the stroller that would strap in two tanks and then my backpack would fit in in front of it so i could actually <laughs> walk these five mile portions with three tanks pushing it and uh my very first uh cart was very crude and i made it myself and i was like yeah change this up because i probably had like 15 or 20 pounds extra weight with my contraption but by the time i had this guy make make this uh framing for me it was nice and light and i could cruise along pretty good and i was doing the five mile aggressively walking mm -hmm. in an hour and a half um which i thought was pretty good for five miles and um with a lung condition this last year they canceled the event because of covid sure and to be honest um it would have been my i think my ninth outing um had it gone out but i probably i don't know that i could have made it this year i i had um in the beginning of 2020 i had a bout of pneumonia um in august or actually no it was 2019 it was right before it was right before my um oh my god 30th class reunion yeah <laughs> and uh, i had about a pneumonia that put me in the hospital for about four days on antibiotics to clear it out and it was kind of funny because it was the week before the reunion mm -hmm. and so everybody's like are you gonna be okay to make the reunion and i'm like oh yeah you know and i no did I, I got out of the hospital made the reunion um you know everything was great but after that going into 2020 um, I ended up having pneumonia again in January, uh, and then it was just progression, basically. Yeah, sure, which, sure. But ended up bumping me up the list to finally get my call for lungs, too, mm -hmm. because it's one of those games with, I call it a game in a way, but the hardest thing I think about transplant is actually getting to the listing process first. Yeah, yeah. Because they, they really work you over. It's a week-long worth of testing and things, but once you get there, you know, that's great. But then it's a waiting game because you're basically given an allocation number yeah. and it places you where you're at. And I was considered a kind of high functioning for my condition mm -hmm. because walking the marathons, you know, and doing 5Ks and different things. But after that pneumonia, it was just a real gradual 
decline in my ability uh, to function and breathe and my PFTs or pulmonary function testing were dropping rapidly. Hmm. And so my, my, my UNOS number uh, went up, which is your allocation number for where you place on transplant lists. And uh, yeah. And so I, it's one of those, you got to get worse to get better things, which is it's, kind of, it, cr- it's literally, yeah. And, and the whole thing is, it just feels like a Christmas miracle. Right. Yeah. And, and I hate to say that I've been like literally using you this past year, but you were a beacon of bright light. Well, thank during you. The entire process. Cause I was, I was checking every night, checking every morning. Um, your superhero bride, Bo, was texting or I, updating those status yeah. online, the occasional yeah. picture. And, you know, and it, I mean, Sean, every, people love you. And in case you didn't realize that, they absolutely love you. Now, people like Jason Benjamin, he's just a monster. So I don't know what, you know, I actually want to ask about him as far as like, what did he come into play with all this? But I mean, again, yeah. you literally led, well, you and Bo led us through your experience. And it's like nothing I, well, actually, I don't ever want to experience it again, for God's sakes. But it was amazing. And there and there was humor in all of this at the same time. So that's kind of something I, I want to touch upon. Like you and John Rucker back in the day, you guys were the clowns that I kind of emulated. I looked up to you guys. And again, one day you were gone. And I was like, what the, yeah. what the hell? Where'd Sean go? And then you show up however many months later with a hole in your throat and you sounded funny. Oh. And we're, <laughs> we're like, what is going, what's happening? Yeah. And then, you know, just by life and everything else, we just, you know, well, you probably didn't want to talk to me as a freshman or whatever the, uh, the uh, case is. We didn't hang a lot, but you've always <laughs> faced everything with humor. Yeah. And yeah. No, it's what gets you through the day. If you can't laugh at yourself and laugh at situations, mm-hmm. you know, I just always found that humor and, and being able to laugh at things or make light of stuff is what gets me through the day. Cause mm-hmm. you know, when I think about it, like even my, um, you know, my current hospitalization with transplant, I mean, I literally came close to dying a couple of times yeah. and, you know, to come out of that. And it's like, you just, you, you can't dwell on the, on the negative, you know, so you got to find something positive in there. So, so that's the thing I, you know, it's like, I don't know, I don't ever do anything normal, yeah. you know, so, you know, and um, yeah, you know, you got to laugh at stuff. So I always make my mom mad because, you know, everything, when it started when I was 14 and uh, she'd always be real caught, you know, super protective. At, and I'm like, I'm a mortal mom. It's okay. You know, nothing can kill me. And so far I've been pretty right. Well, you somebody know. heard you and tried for a number of years. So for crying yeah. out loud, man. And yeah. Itself. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, and now I'm not actually immortal, but I don't know, you know, but yeah, it's, you gotta, you gotta make fun of things in, in a sense. And, that reminds me, and when I was in Children's Hospital at 14, I would make uh, little jokes and things. And one of my favorite things to do, I was still in the ICU unit, and um, I was doing pretty good, but I'd take my leads off mm-hmm. and set the arms off, and they'd run in, and I'd play like this. Um, oh, you actually I, played the role. Oh. Yeah, so automatically, because my tongue's out, you know, they knew I was goofing off, but they get so pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> I had one one male nurse who I just loved him. Uh, his name was Doug Arditi. And uh, he would come and he'd just lecture me, you know, oh, on it. I'm sorry. Eventually I stopped doing it because they were sure. really, yeah. and I realized yeah. at the time I was still having a lot of issues and, and um, having pneumothoraxes, which is like basically your chest wall, you, you end up blowing a hole in your lung more or less and yeah. chest walls kind of thing. So I'd have to get chest tubes and and they're like, that's not funny because you could die. And I'm like, I know. Okay, sorry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and even throughout, you know, a, as an adult dealing with this condition, you, you just got to laugh, you know, and, and make the best of situations. If you dwell in the neck, it'll consume you. So speaking of consuming, yeah. I, know, I know what I went through when my mother had cancer. And I worried. Yeah, I cried and I got stressed 
and she and my father were in Olympia and I was up here, um, the Bothell area, Pacific Northwest, if anyone cares. And I had my life to deal with. I had my kids to deal with. I had at that point, my wife to deal with and, you know, and all these things to keep me away from her. Um, it killed me. It was, it was horrible to have to want to be someplace, but I couldn't. And of course, I'm not a doctor. I don't have the miracle cure. My, my hands were tied. Um, I want to talk about your son. I haven't actually seen any posts for a long time about your son. How is he doing? How are you guys? What did he go through? Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, did he have any problems and were you able to help him? And from the, from the consulting standpoint, or did, did you just make him laugh and just say, you know, go live your life, man, you're old enough now. And with that being said, I don't, re I don't recall how old he is. So tell us yeah. about the boy. Yeah, well, he was four years old when I was diagnosed with the interstitial lung disease and I had to stop working. So really for most of his life, known me on oxygen, you know, that was bad, you know, and uh, he's up the nose the whole time. Now, but, uh, Back at the time, you know, I always try to find the silver linings in things. Yeah. And when I went on disability and, and lost my job, you know, I had a real hard time with losing that identity. First off, as the worker, as the breadwinner, yeah. you know, my first wife, you know, basically ended up, you know, being in that role and it worked out fine. And I was home and fairly stable for the most part, but I was able to uh, volunteer with PTA and, and school and things. I coached soccer for a while for him. Nice. Uh, which was crazy because I'm out there with this backpack full of oxygen bottles, you know, trying to write. knew nothing about soccer really, but I You're learned. Like, Come on, kids. <laughs> yeah. But you know, so he's known this, you know, that that I could possibly end up with a transplant. Mm -hmm. And I was real honest with him at an early age, uh, as age appropriate as you can be as you get older, you know, and we would visit it. And he actually went to some appointments with me uh, as he got older. So he knew what was going to happen. Um, but when August hit and it happened, he was pretty scared. Um, mm -hmm. Me, you know, um, thought of losing me, the reality, especially a um, couple days after transplant, I ended up with this C. diff infection that mm -hmm. they ended up to sedate me for like 17 days. Um, and there was a couple close calls during that time. Yeah. Uh, but that's the thing. So my, like I said, I went in on, Transplant completed on August 30th. Mm -hmm. I 50 on the 3rd of September, um, which I slept through my birthday because I was sedated. <laughs> but I turned 50. Um, and my son's birthday is on the 18th of September. Mm -hmm. Well, I came out of sedation around the 15th, 16th. And actually, the most important thing to me at that point in time, um, of course, was seeing Bo, my wife, and getting to talk to her. Good answer. <laughs> but yeah, that was my first priority. Second priority was really the fact that I had woke up and was able to um, video chat with my son and wish him happy birthday. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So that was, that was amazing. Now, but, I think I spoke over you five minutes ago when you said how old he is now. Can, can you tell that again? Well, that's, I, I think I said 23, but I think he's He's 24, so okay. I, I had to check with Bo. That's so bad. Yeah, but he's 24 now. Okay. Yeah, and uh, you know, when I was in the hospital, he um, had a few hiccups uh, and things with with some stuff dealing with depression and anxiety, his own life uh, mm -hmm. concern for me and stuff. But he uh, he's he's good now. I got to see him, you know, with quarantine and all this stuff going on i actually got to see him about a week and a half ago okay. and and we video chatted and talked on the phone in fact i just talked to him yesterday um a bit so he's doing he's doing good I love yeah that. he loves the fact that like he when we got to see each other in person um you know he's like i just can't get used to you don't have that oxygen stuff i know and i'm <laughs> like yeah I'm <laughs> so, so yeah. do do me a favor right now um yeah. take Take a deep breath. Tell me how that feels. It's, a, it's amazing. Yeah. And amazing to know that I'm doing it on my own and that my oxygen saturation is right, yeah. you know, 
in a good place where it needs to be. Um, and you literally I, have someone else's lungs inside of you. Yeah. Sean, that freaks me the hell out. Like, so, how, are you, <laughs> how are you dealing with it? Tell me. You know, I, I kind of, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it a little bit. You know, I, I'm anxious to find out who my donor is. And that, was, that was my next question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think, I think you, you, you uh, I think there's a policy in place. Basically it, at six months you can write a letter or they can request it. I think the family can request any time. And I'm really hoping that they reach out. Yeah. I definitely plan on writing a letter and um, reaching out because I want to know about the person if I'm able to find out, you know, who they were, um, what their likes, dislikes were. But just the fact that if I find out or not, I want to honor the person who, you know, donated, um, you know, their organs because I got the lungs, which my assumption is if I got the lungs, which are really the hardest organ there is to transplant. Okay. Somebody probably got the heart. Somebody got, you know, kidney, liver, um, eyes. Yeah. Uh, skin. I mean, being a donor is such an amazing gift to, um, you know, pass on to somebody else. Yeah. I mean, I know a lot of people feel different ways about it. It's not something you take on lightly. Um, and I know some people go, oh, it's against my belief system or whatever. And I, I respect that. Mm -hmm. To me, I mean, even I was an organ donor too, because, you know, even though my lungs were crappy and my heart was uh, having issues, which my heart issues have corrected themselves now that I've got the good lungs, which is great. Oh, it's not going to work as hard. <laughs> yeah, but my kidneys, my liver, you know, somebody else. So even, you know, that's, I think, one of the misconceptions people have is, well, I have this health condition, so I can't be a donor. And it's like, no, that's not true. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, check into it. Don't be afraid of it. Because, you know, I mean, I, I always looked at it too. It's like, you know, well, I'm either going to get put in a box and I'm going to rot and, you know, worms are going to eat me or I'm going to get burned up and I'm just going to blow away in the wind. Or I can help somebody else live a better life or yeah. get a second. So, yeah. you know, I'm all about second chances. Well, yeah. you are. I mean, you, well, you are literally a second chance, I, you have a second lease on life. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 I know that this probably falls under the unknowns, but have, <clears throat> how do I ask this? Do you have any idea? Uh, will these last? Um, is it up to the continual yeah. medications to make sure there's oh. never a rejection? Or do I mean, do you have a five year you know, yeah. policy in place now? Yeah. Like, like where, well, where does this where, where does this put you yeah. now, if, if that makes yeah. sense? Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. And it's a great question because it's that's been the hardest part of kind of living in the transplant world is mm -hmm. there's a support group um, for, for the University of Washington with lung transplant people that are pre, you know, waiting for transplant. And then the post people, you know, that have that have gone through it and they're doing great. But it's a roller coaster ride. And so basically what I've done is I've I've traded all those oxygen tanks. Mm -hmm. in, in for medication that I'll have to be on for a lifetime, um, which, you know, in my opinion is okay. Um, yeah. I'm able to be more spontaneous. I can pack some pills with me, but right now, currently, I think, what's my pill count? 28 different? Six. 26. 26. So in the morning, I take um, basically 26 pills, and then I take just a few in the afternoon, and then about half of that in, in the evening. Hmm. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty good regimen of pills. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah. And uh, I also, um, because of transplant, it should resolve itself, but it's medication induced, but I, I'm type two diabetic currently. Mm -hmm. uh, again, once the medications taper off, um, hopefully won't have to do that, but I have to check my, my blood sugars every day. So trying to find a place on your finger that hasn't been poked because <laughs> I'm but four times a day. Wow. Is, is, challenge and then but i'm getting really good at giving myself insulin so Amazing. that's where my, my belly comes in handy you know so sure you know, yeah that. my root beer Added yeah security as well <laughs> there you go yeah um yeah kind of trade off things but really you're kind of in a sense i mean it, it's questionable how much time you're going to gain yeah i know a few people that are 
you know, 20 years, 20 plus years out lung transplant. In fact, a, a woman I ran in just by chance. Um, I used to shop at the grocery outlet store down in Hawks Prairie area near, near Olympia. And I was in there and this gentleman who um, comes up to me and he's like, hi, I noticed you're on oxygen. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, um, are you listed by, for transplant by chance? And I'm like, uh, I said, well, at that time, I'm like, I'm in the process yeah. of getting up for it. And she's like, oh, well, my wife had a transplant at the University of Washington mm. and her pulmonologist is Dr. Ragu. And I'm like, that's my pulmonologist. You know, so we have thing. But I ended up meeting her. And yeah, she, this was probably like nine, nine years ago. Mm -hmm. And she was at 20 year mark at that point. Uh, and had, had no rejection issues, had done wonderful with it, you know, wow. thing. And so I was like, wow, you know, this is, this is my future. Yeah. You know, well, just, it's, it's not like you can ask the average doctor, can I see your portfolio? I mean, like you're, right. you're, you're literally talking to some of his work, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's Remarkable. the thing. And she did end up, she had the same transplant surgeon, you know, that fine. Um, but there are the other stories which are hard to take where, um, like I, a friend of mine who just had a transplant about six years ago, sorry, the cat box is being utilized. That's what that noise is. No, it's okay. Cat's got to do its business. Did the cat just say, I'm sorry, or was that Bo? That was Bo. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry about I'm that. I'm interviewing the cat next if, if yeah. it was her I talking. Hear that noise or not, but... Uh, <laughs> If, if you did hear a noise, that was the cat box. Uh, and anyway, um, where was I? Oh, yeah. But there are things through the transplant group that you hear. A friend of mine um, just passed away in, um, I think it was November. Yeah. And I'd known him for about five years hmm. through the transplant group, you know, and he was one of the first people I kind of connected with in the group. And uh, he had a single lung transplant and his, Basically, his other lung uh, started some complications, and hmm. he ended up passing in November. So that's hard, you know, because he was just just a great guy for one. You know, he had gotten yeah. back to work, and he was coaching softball. You know, and you just you never know what direction it's going to go. So yeah, you know, I, I'm I'm hopeful and mindful that I'm going to be one of those 15, 20 year out, you know, people. Um, you know, and I figure if I can, you know, what does that would put me? 70s. 80s or 90s or whatever. Sure. My, that's a good life, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Considering like to, they, hit a, they hit a reset button on you only, only, yeah. only a few weeks ago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a crapshoot. You know, you trade, you trade one issue for another issue. So, mm -hmm. it's like, I'm, I'm not sick anymore, but... I'm healthier, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know? no, it ab but absolutely does. Biggest, the biggest thing that people run into. Um, so, you know, I'll have to be very mindful. Um, mm -hmm. Even after COVID goes away, I'll still probably be a mask wearer for in certain places and sure. precautions. Yeah, um, yeah. But, tell yeah. Me, tell me about the restaurant that you are a huge fan of and you quite often post pictures that make me want to get into my vehicle and drive like a crazy person all the way down to, you know, even, even do, the, do the joint shakes out of both of our hands and somehow ro romantically yet politically correct drink from those shakes and or the onion rings and burgers. Tell me about what they've done for you, if memory oh. serves, and what you've been doing for them by way of exposure. Oh, Eastside Big Toms. There we go. <laughs> yeah, Eastside Big Toms. People. Uh, Michael Fritch, the owner, just an amazing guy. Um, but yeah, they, it's funny, um, through Facebook, um, you know, I'd, I'd always gone there, you know, over the years and stuff. And as a kid, my dad uh, loved milkshakes mm -hmm. and so go through there and get milkshakes a lot. And then just, uh, you know, occasionally I'd go in and get a burger or this kind of thing. And, um, uh, Michael had done a, a some kind of a contest thing on on through Facebook, and I'd answered questions or whatever. And anyway, we ended up meeting at one point, and we just clicked, kind of thing. And he's just this just really amazing guy, generous with the community, the things he does. 
but yeah, he uh, said, Hey, you want to do a fundraiser? And I'm like, really? And he's yeah. like, yeah. Who says no and, to that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, okay. And I was like, you know, Oh, that'd be cool. And uh, yeah, we basically put on a burger fundraiser. Um, and uh, it, it raised quite a bit of money for me, which was great, you know, because mm -hmm. um, waiting for transplant is not a cheap endeavor no. uh, with medical costs and everything. So um, that was that was a, just amazing. And the community uh, that turned out for that was just awesome. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I've probably not right now uh, because of my hair, but at different times, I've had people like go, do you know, you kind of look like Tom Hanks. Oh, and I'm yeah. like, what? All right. But I'm like, okay, I've embraced it. Um, if you got to look like somebody, that's not a bad deal. So I heard he's bald right now. So I probably look closer to him now. He, well, he, 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 he and his head. wife during COVID, um, yeah. he, he did have an altercation with, with his recovery from COVID. Yeah. Apparently that's why he shaved his noggin for a while. I don't think it was for a role, but um, I could be wrong. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just, oh well. I'm up on my Tom Hanks. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to just call him. Yeah, I'm on speed dial. That's the other class I think you and I were in. I don't know. I might be mistaken. But I think we were in debate together. Yes. Yes. That was high school class. Yes. Remember right. Yes. Okay. Anyway. But, uh, and then um, about a year or two later, he's like, he got into doing these podcast things, which were really cool. And he's like, and um, I, I'd just kind of gone through my second divorce. Anyway, that's a long story. I won't go into, uh, but he's like, Hey, you want to do another fundraiser? I'm like, yeah. And so we, we did another one and again, raised a great, great little bit of money and got some exposure um, for him and for me. And, and it was just fantastic. And each time, the reason I brought up the Tom Hanks thing mm -hmm. was he, he named the burger, the Tom Hanks burger. Yep. And so the first one was like ridiculously giant, huge, crazy. And it was like five bucks for the burger if you eat it all and 10 bucks if you can't, you know, and everybody just gave 10 bucks because yeah. you were fries, you know, you're getting a drink, all this stuff and, you know, refills on the drink and refills on the fries. And, you know, his, his uh, vendors were very generous in donating, you know, the, the stuff to, sure. to, to happen, which was amazing. And the second time around he did the Tom Hanks Jr., which was a little bit, it was still ridiculous, but it was a little bit smaller. But yeah, it, it was just a great event. And so anytime, you know, and I follow them on Facebook and anytime they're doing something, I try to push it forward and push it forward, mm -hmm. you know, for him. Um, but I love the place. In fact, our first trip down to Olympia a few weeks back, I had to stop, you know, mm -hmm. and get a burger. And, and um, it, yeah, it's just that really good kind of, hometown you know yeah cooking, you know yeah. and the magic goop so you know the goop yeah it's well so. we we have one of those around here and it's called the ranch drive-in and ah. um it's it's the same mentality you know they've been around yeah. forever i don't have that level of connection because i've only been in this area for 15 some odd years whatever but yeah, yeah it's, it's as far as that particular taste and that magic sauce on it yeah, you just, you just can't go wrong. And I've, I've just always loved seeing the the relationship, the friendship that you guys have had over the years. And yes, that level of support and everything, it just has been absolutely sweet to see. Um, how are they doing now currently during the pandemic? You know, from what I can tell, they've done a job of Good. kind of inventing and doing what they can do. Um, when we went there a week and a half ago, they were pretty much fully staffed and you know, lines around the corner kind of thing. Um, they're unlimited hours to some degree. Um, they do have some outside seating uh, that they're doing a great job with, you know, making sure everything's distanced mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of thing. All the staff is wearing masks and gloves and, you know, doing all the right stuff. But yeah, they're just cranking it out and, you know, feeding the community like they've always done. That's and awesome. uh, they do these little special events like every so often where they do a a burger thing that's called the glazed and confused so it's basically cut a cut a glazed donut in half and make a burger out of it you know that sounds uh, amazing yeah tots and gravy which is 
it's just incredible. It's it's just basically tater tots with cheese and gravy on it, but it's just amazing. So kind of, yeah, so they'll do oh, these little. Man. Oh, it's great. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's right. Helping and serving the community as best they can. Yeah. So surviving, surviving. Good so, to be. Yeah. Good to be um, okay, so one last uh, shift, if you will, uh, because we're actually almost coming up on time. It, it, it goes quickly. Yeah. Tell me again a little bit more about the lovely Bo. Um, didn't know she was number three, but third time yeah. is the charm. How did you guys connect and meet and... Um, you know, again, this is an opportunity for you to score a point or two as well. Sure. What, what do you want to share about what she's meant to you, especially uh, over the last 10 plus months and just this experience that you guys have been through? Oh, man. Um, yeah, I don't think, you know, and it's nothing negative necessarily about my first two wives. <laughs> oh, sure. But I don't know that either one of them could have really done and gone through this. Knowing, knowing what I know now, you know, being. Oh, of course. But Bo's been amazing, and she knew what she was getting into. Um, we actually met in middle school. In choir. In choir. Um, and I had to remind her about it, but um, I would play Dungeons and Dragons before, before the bell would ring at school and at lunch with her brother, Larry. <coughs> and when I re reacquainted with Larry at a family gathering at her uh, mom's, I, I was like, Larry, do you remember? He's like, I'll act like he's just meeting me now. And I'm like, no, no, no. We knew each other in sixth and seventh grade. I'd play Dungeons and Dragons. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, so, so yeah, Bo and I actually met in middle school. Um, weren't really, other than, you know, high kind of thing. Um, but kind of ended up through high school in the same circle of people. Yeah. Where we saw each other, but there wasn't any like, Hey, let's go out with anything like that. Yeah. The mirror of uh, social media about seven or eight years ago, roughly, we connected on Facebook and uh, just had a few conversations here and there. You know, a mutual friend of ours um, was going to get some axolotls from her, mm -hmm. from Bo. We had some axolotls, cutest yeah. little, they're like little sea monkeys. Yeah. Uh, but, and I had an aquarium that I was getting rid of. And so, Anyway, we kind of connected through this aquarium transfer of picking up axolotls anyway. So that was great. Um, but I still hadn't seen her, but we'd have conversations. And then anyway, so about three years ago, she finally got up. Uh, we were having a conversation. She's like, we should, we should get together for coffee. I'm like, yeah, great. That'd be, that'd be great. So we kind of set it up and uh, to meet. And um, prior to that, I, it was coming up on September and my birthday and I, I'd, I'd seen the Puyallup Fair was having this like eighties uh, concert thing, you know, sure. and I post out to my son going, Hey buddy, I've taken you to so many concerts. Cause I've taken, I took him to Lady Gaga several times and which I got it. I got to admit, I liked. Um, Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, and a couple other concerts that were like, eh, but you know, you do what you do for your kids. Right. And uh, so I was like, Spencer, you got to take me to this thing at the fair. And he kind of came back with like, uh, no, <laughs> I'm like, come on. <laughs> well, both in, in the conversation, he goes, I'll take you. I'm like, okay. Anyway, so she ended up getting it. And it was actually on my birthday. So prior to that, we did get together for the coffee. Um, and we met at Tumwater Falls Park mm. and it just clicked. Um, we had great conversation and it just kind of went from there and started dating and I did the concert and, and together and it was just so much fun. And again, that just click and like we'd been together and for each of us, it's a third marriage, a uh, third serious relationship, but um, she had um, some surgical things coming up at that time when we first started dating. She's like, I'm not sure about starting a relationship because I've got this surgery coming up. I'm thinking about buying a house and she's like, what the hell? We'll just, I'll throw a relationship into the mix. You know, think good things come in threes. Yeah, sure. And, you know, we didn't really connect that until a few months later when we were talking about getting married and we're like, this could be a third marriage for each of us. And we're like, yeah, you know, good things come in threes. Mm -hmm. Right. And so she had her surgery and I helped her through that process and, and uh, we bought the house and um, 
all that good stuff and obviously started the relationship because now we're married um and yeah third time's a charm so and and through this whole process of transplant that was the thing we both put all our baggage out you know on the table going in because we're like we're experienced you know <laughs> step back and go. Uh, that's a lot of yeah. baggage okay yeah <clears throat> yeah we've seen the bad the ugly and now it's time for the good you know yeah sure you know, to go through there so yeah and honestly to date right now we have never had um in my opinion an actual fight you know or anything we always go to bed you know with a kiss and a good night um there's always somewhere in the day you know and i love you and it's not to say we haven't disagreed on a few things but it's been powerfully. amazing powerfully disagreed yeah you know <laughs> but the resolution which is fantastic i've never had that in the past you know and it's just amazing but she has been a rock um through all of this and when things took a turn um right after transplant she scrambled because we were thinking about so we we you know i grew up in olympian stuff but i had moved to tacoma mm -hmm. and that's where we our house is at and she we were going to go back to the house after transplant because we were just right within return radius that we could have went home sure but i was still under sedation and stuff she got to thinking about, you know, the time, the travel time, everything. Um, not sure how long I was going to be in the hospital at that point in time. Yes, yeah. She scrambled and got an apartment just above the U Village, kind of near the frat houses, um, near the campus of UW, and uh, got set up an apartment so we didn't have to do the travel. And so it's been a real godsend. But for her to do that, uh, go through that process, to think that quickly, to put that together, be there for me. I mean, she stayed with me in that in that room for like 20 days yeah. straight you know, uh, yeah. without. And, um, you know, once I was stabilized and, and, and looking to do better, mm -hmm. she started putting all this stuff together. But she got this apartment sight unseen, uh, got a great rent because student camp, you know, the campus is light on student because everything's virtual. Sure. Uh, had to lock into a year lease, but for the price of the apartment in Seattle, it was like, yeah, we'll do it's that. Worth it. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And we're literally like a mile and a half from the, the hospital. So sure. it takes us like five, 10 minutes tops to get there. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as appointments start to drop down, um, you know, I, we're going to go a little stir crazy, uh, missing, missing home, yeah. but we have been able to make a few trips down and see the place and do some things. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah. Well, not all superheroes wear capes, but yeah. she definitely should have one. So contract or contract your seamster guy that you know yeah. from back in the day and have him make one. It's amazing. Yeah, she's she's been incredible. You know, roll with it and, and quick thinking. And with medications and things, I do forget a few things. Yeah. And she's great in, you know, reminding me to do stuff and helping me with things. Now that I'm getting uh, more strength back and I'm starting to be able to, you know, do more for myself. It's, I, um, I, I felt really bad one, you know, I, it's not necessarily a guy. I think it's a people thing, but it's kind of a guy thing. You know, we don't like to ask for help. Oh, you yeah. know, yeah. kind of, but felt real bad first. When we first got home because not only is she doing for me, but she's doing all her stuff too. And trying to balance that. We've got these two crazy cats, you know, so she's tracking those. We're in this small apartment. Yep. you know and um so I, i've been able to regain some function and do some things i've, I've felt better about that but she's just been amazing though okay. yeah i couldn't have got through this without her i love that i love that and thank you bo you're incredible <laughs> oh, both. yeah all right sean so as we as we start the little wrap up here i want to know if you i mean based off of everything you've been through uh -huh. Uh, gosh, <laughs> since that day you didn't show up to Glee class, um, what's 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 the one thing that you want to tell people about your experience and or mm. if people are faced something even close to it? You know what what yeah. what nugget can you drop for them? Um, you know, I think being a good self manager of your condition, mm. you know. I think, and that's one thing um, I did get involved with um, right after I lost my job and things a couple of years later. 
um, I had a pulmonologist at, at uh, Group Health or Kaiser now, um, but recommend I took this self-management class. Mm-hmm. I was like, I'll take it. And uh, I got into it as a participant and it was pretty, it was pretty good, you know, but I, I really thought I was going to have a lot of participants that had, you know, life-threatening issues like I did. Yeah. And a lot of the people had depression and I was kind of pissed off at the time. So, and I know people are going to go, wait a minute, but, but wait a minute. Um, by about the third session, we talked about depression and a light bulb went off in my head. Mm-hmm. And I realized yeah, I've got this life-threatening thing, but the biggest thing I'm not dealing with is my depression. So, the, okay. wow, you know, and I, so I connected with this group of people and it was like, this is, inc- I get it now. Mm-hmm. Depression is a chronic condition and it's real, you know, and I wasn't dealing with it. So anyway, long story short, I ended up becoming a um, lay leader for the program. And over the years, I ended up becoming a master trainer mm-hmm. where I could train leaders uh, in self-management. It's a Stanford-based program that uh, Group Health and Kaiser were doing. It's all online currently. Mm-hmm. Um, this amazing Dr. Uh, Kate Lorig, uh, who I've actually become friends with, which is amazing. Um, but she she helped develop it with another group of people down at Stanford. But I cross-trained in, so I did the chronic disease, the diabetes, and then the pain management recently. Sure. So, programs that I was uh, qualified as a master trainer in but those things engaging yourself in things so for me that was my saving grace it gave me back an identity that I had lost mm-hmm. by the work full-time nobody really wants to fire a volunteer you know yeah. <laughs> which is great uh, although we did have to let a few go at different times for certain things but uh, overall it, it was really great it gave me purpose uh, it gave me some drive but it also kept me accountable for myself yeah through action plans, being accountable to a group of people, accountable for myself. So I think the biggest takeout that I can leave anybody else is if you end up with a chronic condition or some kind of um, health issue Mm -hmm. where you're overwhelmed and you think, I can't do this again, you can. I mean, that's my belief. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I know there's some realities, but you just got to modify and adapt you know, and stay engaged. Mm-hmm. You know, there's lots of, you know, COVID times have made it challenging, sure. but there's lots of programs where through the libraries or whatever, where kids need to be read to, you know, or, or if you're, you do a craft, if you knit or sew, that you can make, make masks, make um, toys, you know, yeah. do something that gives, gives you joy, purpose, even if it takes a little longer, but stay engaged in life, you know, at whatever level you're able to. Well, um, and- and like you always said for years, and I hope you continue to say, is make every breath count. Yeah. Yeah. You got a choice. You can give up or you can keep going. Yeah. You know, it's every day getting up and making every breath count. Yeah. And now you got two lungs to help with that. Yes. <laughs> I yeah. still can't believe it. I'm so oh. happy. You were the best Christmas present this year, man, I t- or this previous year now, because um, that was just such a joy to experience. Um, but again, never make me do that again, for the love no. of God. Okay? No more. You're done. Who's in the head? Oh my gosh. Okay, Sean, um, thank you so much for being part of this broadcast. I want to end with the James Lipton tribute want to give you those quick questions that everybody gets. Um, everybody has fun trying to answer as briefly as they can. Uh, my dog might stick her head in now. She just like shook her head and she's over here now. Um, so do your best here. What is one of your biggest pet peeves? Oh, dishonesty. Ooh, ooh, I like that. Okay. What's your favorite place you've ever been to or would like to go to? Oh boy, Australia. Okay. I've been there and I want to go back. Well, and John Rucker's got a place there for you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and if you could be known for only one thing, what would that be? Oh, one thing. You know, I, I'm kind of modest in a lot of ways, but I, I would hope it would be in inspiring people to, you know, through my story, through my experiences, um, 
through, you know, to stay positive, to be motivated, you. you know, to inspire them to, you know, look at their situation. Even though mine is, it is like this mountain of lung transplant, everybody is going through something. And the problems we encounter are really the same, yeah. you know, be that depression, be that, you know, frustration with working with the medical community, you know, um, trying to relearn how to do certain things, but, but inspiring through, you know, oh, here's this guy who was dragging around oxygen and he's still walking five Ks, yeah. you know, um, you know, push yourself, inspire yourself. Love that, and 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 for what it's worth, for the record, you are a bit of a showboat. Okay, I, I I doubt I'll be able to you know interview anybody anytime soon that said you know I recently lost my head, and it, <laughs> put back, I mean you've definitely topped the scales there. So congratulations. Um, well, <laughs> All right. Well, Sean, again, um, thank you so much for being part of this. It was a joy to reconnect. Um, your voice is a little scraggly now, so you have permission to take the rest of the day off. I've run you ragged. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll end with the little outro that I do for you and for everyone else that might be listening and now watching. When you're out there in between these podcasts, um, whether you're social distancing, the six feet, connecting with Zoom, or you're surrounded by those that you know and love, please be a witness. Please be real and be present to those you care about and love. And why am I challenging you, Sean, and Bohemia in the background? Um, because every once in a while, we just need to take a moment, sit back, and shut up and laugh. Absolutely. Thanks again, Sean. Appreciate you, brother. No, no problem. Thank you. You bet. All right. Love you, buddy. You too.